Some especially heavy traffic in the downtown area, causing long delays. A mile and a half back up now, northbound on the Harbor Tunnel Thruway. Southbound traffic heavy too, but moving much better. We're checking reports of an accident now at Windsor Mill and Essex. Also, the right curb lane on Northern Parkway at Green Spring is blocked now by a disabled vehicle. From the Harbor Tunnel Thruway, backed up two miles northbound because of the heavy volume there. Building quite a bit now on both loops of the Beltway and slower in spots. Well, I think this traffic is deplorable. <clears throat> I've been on highways all across the country, and this is probably the slowest highway I've ever been in. I hate it. It just seems like it goes on and on and on. Every time we come up this way, we run into a backup like this. I go through this just about every, uh, every weekend, and sometimes uh, it's as much as an hour to get through the tunnel. This is the worst stretch of road between here and New York. I can't believe you have to pay to use it. Those drivers are trying to get through one of the busiest tunnels in America, the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel. Believe it or not, this is on the main route between New York and Washington. Over 60,000 vehicles a day go through here. For people who make the effort, it's an endless source of delay and frustration. But it won't be this way for long, because only a quarter of a mile north of here, a new tunnel is being built. Near this famous and familiar part of American history, Fort McHenry. It was here that Francis Scott Key wrote the words to the Star-Spangled Banner during the British attack on the fort in the War of 1812. But now, Fort McHenry will be known for something else vital to our nation, as the site of a critical link in the National Interstate and Defense Highway Program. The 1.7-mile Fort McHenry Tunnel is the largest project in the history of that program. What will it mean to all of us? Bill Helmer of the Interstate Division of Baltimore City. The existing Baltimore Harbor Tunnel, which is the only crossing of the harbor, is already carrying twice the traffic it was designed for. The Fort McHenry Tunnel will solve that very serious problem in the Northeast Transportation Corridor. The Fort McHenry Tunnel is essential for a number of reasons. When it's complete, it will complete I-95 in Maryland. It is integral to the entire highway system in the Northeast Corridor. It feeds the vital port of Baltimore. It will greatly relieve traffic congestion in the existing Baltimore Harbor Tunnel. It's going to be a good neighbor for Fort McHenry. I'm very happy to be here representing the Department of Transportation on this occasion. My words for everyone is, let's get this groundbreaking ceremony over and get our hands dirty, get to work, and get this tunnel built. One, two, three. And in 1980, it began. In May of that year, the contract to build the tunnel went to the joint venture of Peter Kiewit Sons Company, Raymond International Builders, and Tidewater Construction Corporation. Their main job, to place 32 steel-shelled, concrete-lined tunnel elements, or tubes, in a dredged trench that will cross Baltimore Harbor. The tunnel is to be eight lanes wide, and each double-barreled tube carries four lanes. That means two tubes must be placed side by side, 10 feet apart, in water up to 110 feet deep. But there would be much more to the job than that. From the very beginning, the people at KRT knew this project would be unique. When we uh, got the plans uh, to bid on this job and learned about the project, we decided that uh, it certainly was a job that required a lot of engineering and planning. Uh, the company and joint venture have built several tube jobs, uh, which uh, also required a lot of engineering planning, but we uh, thought this one was more, uh, unique in the sense that uh, it had some things that these other tube jobs didn't have. What that meant was an extraordinary amount of coordination between all the people involved and between eight different phases of the job. Each stage had to be executed precisely to keep everything moving on schedule. A delay in any one phase could produce other costly delays down the line. From the engineers and designers to the supervisors and work crews, each was a critically important link in the chain of construction. Besides dredging and installing the tubes, a containment site had to be built to hold the material from the dredging. At the east end of the tunnel, buildings had to be demolished and a new pier built. A major city water main had to be relocated. 
and the tubes themselves had to be built and outfitted. All this required different subcontractors and involved a KRT workforce of some 430 people. To give you an idea of how enormous this project is, let me say that constructing just the tunnel took three and a half years and cost $434 million. After all, we're building the world's widest concrete tube tunnel. It takes 16 pair of tubes, the largest ever placed. Each of them is 340 feet long, making the entire tunnel over 5,000 feet long and 180 feet wide. The route of the tunnel was determined by the Interstate Division for Baltimore City and the Federal Highway Administration. On the east side of the harbor, it begins inland about a quarter of a mile which meant that KRT had to place the better part of eight tubes on land at Clinton Street in the Lower Canton Industrial Area. From there, the tunnel descends and curves around the fort, both horizontally and vertically, in order to create a 50-foot navigational channel in the middle of the harbor. It passes south of Fort McHenry, and finally ascends, coming out onto Andre Street on the Locust Point Peninsula. The first thing on the construction agenda in 1981, building the containment site a mile and a half southeast of the tunnel. This is the containment site, which was one of the first phases of construction that we had to undertake. And this work was started in September of 1980. The storage area itself is achieved by constructing steel, sheet pile, cellular coffer dams in the harbor, and earth dikes on land. The area you see filled in now was originally part of the Baltimore Harbor. 146 acres of water had to be displaced to be filled in with excavation material from the bottom of the harbor. To do this, KRT mobilized 12 major pieces of marine equipment. Their purpose, to first build 76 cellular coffer dams and connecting arcs, which would hold the material in place. The containment site had to be finished before dredging for the tunnel could start. That meant work here had to be done on two 12-hour shifts, six days a week, during the cold, wintry months of 1981. To build the cells, first a steel template, designed by KRT, was set into the proper location, using electronic survey equipment from land. Steel sheet piling was then set around the template. That's what forms the cell to its proper diameter, 62 feet across. The sheet piling was then driven into the earth below the water. Material was then dug out within the cells to a predetermined grade. And sand was put into the cells up to the proper elevation. the cells were being built, earth dikes were being constructed on the land section by a local minority contractor, all part of the tight time schedule. The end result is a 5,600 foot cellular wall to contain three and a half million cubic yards of dredged material. That material was pumped to the containment site through a 27 inch discharge pipe. One of the major features of the site is a large treatment facility, which removes suspended solids from the dredge material. It consists of a 100-foot treatment basin and a 100-foot wide by 1,000-foot long settlement basin. Water flows to the treatment basin, where it's treated chemically, then flows through the settlement basin to allow the solids to settle out. This is the first time this type of treatment facility has ever been used on a major dredging project. To get this part of the job done quickly and efficiently, KRT made six value engineering cost proposals. The result was a new design, saving money and time. In fact, this phase of the project was finished ahead of schedule. And in the future, what is now the containment site will become a 156-acre marine terminal for the Maryland Port Authority. It will be the second largest marine terminal in the Port of Baltimore, with direct access to the main ship channel in the harbor. At the same time the containment site was being built, Kiewit was here working on the preparation of the east end of the project. This work was done concurrently with the containment site because of the tight time schedule with the project. Since eight of the tubes are actually on land, 
This area had to be cleared of existing buildings and utilities. Even railroad tracks were relocated. Some 10 acres had to be demolished. There were 54 buildings that had to come down and a major road had to be detoured around the excavated trench. The area was then cleared and a soldier pile, lagging and earth tieback system were installed to support the ground while excavation for the tubes took place. But there were other problems on the east side of the harbor. Lee Weichel. One of the most difficult operations in the preparation of the east end was the removal and installation of the 48-inch water main. The proposed alignment of the new Fort McHenry Tunnel follows just south of Fort McHenry. At the same location as the existing 48-inch water main that travels from the Lazaretto Canton area of Baltimore City across the harbor to Fort McHenry and then south to the Fairfield, Brooklyn area of Baltimore City. The original proposal as uh, planned by the city was to make a wet tap connection at this location. In studying the, uh, and making preparations to do this work, we discovered that it was uh, impossible to make a live tap on the concrete pipe. KRT's plan was to shut the water line down pump the water out of the existing line and break out the pipe at a location on Clinton Street. This meant that a major water line supplying South Baltimore would be out of service for up to 48 hours. There were risks involved in this plan, but KRT convinced the city that the risks were low enough and the savings substantial enough to make it workable. And on the 9th of January, 1981, they went to work. First, the line was shut down and removed. After it was broken out, specially fabricated concrete tees and a closure piece to adapt it to the existing pipe were installed. The new line, already in place to the concrete tee, was attached, and the line was closed off with a valve. That end of the line was ready. At the same time, at another end of the project, the existing cast iron pipe was being cut. A cap was installed, and the new line was tied through a live tap made on the cast iron pipe. The work was done at night, in freezing temperatures and a snowstorm. But as a result of KRT's careful pre-planning, the entire operation went off without a hitch. Within just 24 hours, the line was put back into service. But the 48-inch water main still had to be connected to the new relocated line, and it had to be done in the middle of the harbor under 50 feet of water. A coffer dam was built for access to the existing line. During preparation of the job estimate, and the initial planning of this project, one of the toughest portions of work we realized would be the installation of this coffer dam to tap and tie into the existing water line which runs south from Fort McHenry across the harbor to Fairfield. Like every other phase of the project, the coffer dam required detailed pre-planning and engineering. It sits on very hard clays 45 feet under the water. To build the structure, a three-ring system of bracing, weighing about 140 tons, was set as one unit. Heavy sheet piling was used due to the hard driving required. As a result of the anticipated hard driving and the importance of properly interlocked sheet piling, great pains were taken to set and incrementally drive the sheets. Existing material was excavated from within the coffer dam down to the top of the existing pipe. Next, the existing pipe was exposed and closures were built around it using divers. In order to do this, a mock-up was made and studied by the divers, and the work then went exactly as planned. Once in place, the water was pumped out of the coffer dam and a concrete whale strut system at the bottom of the coffer dam was installed. 